Try us in the fishbowl. All right. Oh. Here we go. Done. It's like Russian roulette. This. Yeah. What do you want for lunch? No, Are that you can't serious? be right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a, that's a great question. Brandy? <laughs> I'm having my lunch right now. It's in a glass. What photo do you wish you had taken? Oh, God. That's a hard question. Have you missed one? Almost every session I have, uh, there's, there's a feeling of failure. That's, that's so true. Is it it's, time or is it just you missed the, you, you miss the moment? They wouldn't do it or I oh, wasn't smart it. enough to, Hindsight. to connect with a moment. Uh -huh. uh, it's normally a sense of failure on my part that yeah. I wasn't quick yeah. enough or observant enough. Or but I you didn't. said like with Clinton, you only had eight minutes. So I mean, no, eight much? minutes is a long time is actually, it? if you're really focused. Um, I remember each session, how long it took. I, I remember Putin gave me seven minutes, Chavez gave me 30 seconds and I just got one frame. Seconds. But he's yeah. such a great character that it's enough, just yeah. one frame is enough. But um, there's been so many losses and misses and often what I do is my failure on one shoot bugs me so much that the next shoot comes along mm. and I, I force myself to take that in mind and sometimes it creates a success on another shoot. I'm Mark Seliger and this is Capture. I was at the United Nations General Assembly. I was waiting to photograph Obama after he'd made his speech backstage. Suddenly there was this crowd swell of about 150 people coming towards us uh, and it was the Libyan delegation and Gaddafi had heard that I was there doing these portraits of world leaders and he chose that moment to sit for me so he was walking in the middle of this crowd with a kind of slow motion defiance mm. surrounded by about 15 female bodyguards dressed head to foot in military clothing it was like a scene from Star Wars <laughs> and he marched right up to me and gestured as if to say I will sit for you Mr. Platon uh, but I will do it under the nose of the White House administration. And that defiance, where he was actually defying America, he was doing it while Obama was making a speech a few feet away, and uh, the, the, the White House uh, sort of entourage were, were all standing there watching me take his picture. So he's defying America, and that defiance permeated the picture. Mm. And when you look at it now, you perfect. just, you feel it. Yeah, it's perfect. But the, the chilling bit for me was that when a year and a half later, on April the 20th, which was my birthday, I got the call that a, f a friend and a, a colleague of mine, Tim Hetherington, the great photojournalist, had just been killed in Libya, covering the carnage mm. that Gaddafi had caused. So uh, as I got the news, I happened to be reprinting this picture and I saw Gaddafi's giant face coming out of my printer, still defiant, still um, giving me the evil eye. Interesting, people look at that picture, but they don't realize why he was being so defiant. I mean, I love the idea of democracy with photographers. I don't believe one is more important than the other. I don't believe one is higher or lower than the other. I think it's a great honor to say you're a photographer. We are the document, documenters of our time. I look at this picture of this uh, woman laying across, it looks like, and I can't tell whether it's in a sofa, it's dark, it, there's like this kind of crazy mystery to it. I was in Miami uh, one New Year's Eve and I had my camera and I just thought it would be interesting to document the night and because people get crazy on New Year's Eve, right? right? It's a, there's, there's a freedom to it that maybe there isn't in any other night of the year. I got to see people and people let me take their pictures. I wasn't embarrassed to take their picture right. for that particular night. I don't know why. Maybe it was a new camera or it was, it was a new experience. So I took, I don't know, probably 200 pictures that night. But it was all of New Year's Eve and sort of the party Amazing. or non-party, whatever you want to call it, of, of what people go through on that night. I mean, do you find that the camera um, allow you to interact in a way that's special? When you look at a picture, 
you can decide what it is. Yeah. And no one has to explain it to you. The truth is we're just documenting someone's existence. That's a, such a beautiful thing. The picture that you took just yeah. on a random day genuinely becomes the most valuable thing in your life because that picture has the relationship in it, yeah. embedded in the surface of the print. I was approached by Human Rights Watch and they said they had a problem. They said that they have all these statistics, but no one's interested. So they asked me to humanize them. We went to Egypt during the revolution and I built a photo studio in the middle of Tahrir Square and I invited the revolution to come and sit for me. There was this guy and he would play songs like a kind of young Bob Dylan to everyone in the square every day to motivate people and say, come on, let's stay together, let's stay strong. So one night the authorities wanted to make an example of him. They ripped his shirt off and they began to taser his back mm -hmm. as a torture. Now they had a policy that uh, they will stop tasering once you start screaming. But this guy was so strong internally that he refused to scream and they kept going until his back caught fire. He nearly died. They rushed him to hospital. Three weeks later, the day he was released from hospital, he came to me. He took his shirt off. And I have never witnessed anything as extreme as this. I've never seen scars from a torture victim before. I burst into tears. He said, Platon, my friend, don't feel sorry for me because I wear these marks on my back with great pride because they're evidence of me changing my country for the better. And he said, I need your help. I want you to photograph me not as a victim, but as a victor because when they hurt me more and more, I grew stronger and stronger. So I did this picture of him presenting me with the scars on his back and he's holding his guitar like it's a weapon. That became like a poster for the revolution. I think when you said story, you know, storytellers, it's like that is the most powerful example of what it can, it can be. I've, I've spent my professional life around this idea of power a lot, but power is something that's just borrowed. You can't keep it. There's a transference of power now going on in the world and people are taking control from the powers that be. They're taking it back and you're seeing it in revolution around the world, you're seeing it with technology is enabling people to do it, and photography is playing a huge role. Mm -hmm. But um, this notion um, that power is, is owned is completely wrong. Uh, power is something that you borrow, and you borrow it or you're entrusted with it with great, it's a privilege, and it's amazing, like all great, re great revolutions, how everything that's pure is often hijacked by people who aren't so pure. All right. Well, I've got a question for you. All right. What separates the good photographers from the great ones? Like any art form, there's a certain amount of excitement in going through a process of a project and then also closing the door. For me, it's all about evolving and changing and doing different things.